Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Ali Khayat, and uh, I would also like to thank uh, the Kuwait Association of Surgeons and the Surgical Texts uh, for the invitation to be part of this uh, educational uh, uh, series. Um, uh, basically, um, uh, this uh, session we're going to cover two uh, common, commonly, question, commonly, uh, commonly asked uh, topic uh, with regard to the endocrine surgery. Uh, first, we're going to start with the primary hyperparathyroidism. And uh, then we're going to go into the uh, adrenal incidentaloma. Okay. Just to, uh, to start, the objective of um, uh, the primary hyperparathyroidism is we're going to go overview of the surgical anatomy of the parathyroid gland. We're going to. Hello. Welcome, welcome back. Yeah, to... I'm sorry. I don't know where the connection is from my end or from your end. Um, either way, we're going to keep going. So basically the objective, as you can see here, um, basically we're going to spend some time on the anatomy and then differentiate what's a utopic and ectopic uh, parathyroid gland, uh, how to diagnose a primary hyperthyroidism, what are the indications for surgical intervention, I spent some time on localization method. I think this is one of the most important and controversial um, uh, topic uh, with regard to the primary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, different approach for the surgery, either minimal invasive or focused parathyroidectomy versus um, uh, bilateral neck exploration. And then what are the adjuncts to help you identify parathyroid gland, uh, the Miami criteria? So before we start uh, with the presentation, we will uh, start with the questions first, uh, and it will come up as a poll. Okay. You can go um, ahead. Okay. So just for uh, uh, just to go through the question very quickly, um, so you are performing a focused parathyroidectomy for a 55 years old female with a primary hyperparathyroidism. The preoperative localization showed a right inferior parathyroid adenoma. Intraoperatively, you were, however, unable to identify the adenoma. What is the most common location for a missed parathyroid adenoma at re-exploration? Okay, to the next question. So we'll move on to the next uh, question. You are performing a focused parathyroidectomy with intraoperative parathyroid hormone monitoring, IOPTH, on a 56 years old female with a primary hyperparathyroidism. Pre-op localization studies indicated left superior parathyroid adenoma. Intraoperatively, pre-incision, pre-excision were 15 and 17 um, uh, bicamol per liter respectively. Uh, following the excision of the abnormal gland, the five and the 10 minute level were 12 and 13 respectively. What is the most appropriate next step? And to the next question. So the next question is a 40 years old female with a, a nephrolithiasis and osteopenia underwent parathyroidectomy for primary hyperparathyroidism. During the surgery, you identify all parathyroid gland that appeared normal, but the left inferior gland was missing. All attempts to identify it were unsuccessful. Uh, sorry, this is unsuccessful and you, si you decided to conclude the surgery. Postoperatively, the calcium and the BTH remain elevated. What is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? All right, so um, uh, basically we'll talk about the anatomy of the parathyroid uh, uh, gland. And um, you always have to, uh, one of those few things about the embryology that you have to, if you wanna do a parathyroid surgery, you need to understand what's the embryology of the parathyroid gland. We have uh, basically four glands, the two upper glands, they come from the fourth branchial pouch and they migrate caudally to the thyroid. They have a narrow span uh, of distribution. So the migration or the descent is very narrow. Unlike the lower uh, gland, which basically come from the third branchial pouch and they migrate caudally with the thymus. So from the neck, go, they, they go all the da down with the thymus and basically they have a longer line of descent, more variability in the distribution. The majority of the individuals have four glands, two uppers and two lowers. About 13% will have more, and less than 3% will have less than four glands. Um, superior gland, they're basically located posterior, medially, um, posterior medial surface of the uh, middle to the superior thyroid uh, lobe near the tracheosubial uh, group. They tend to be posterior to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Whereas the inferior gland, they're inferior to the lower thyroid lobe, and they tend to be anterior to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. 
So um, they're very, very small. They weigh about 15 to 35 grams. Their length is about three to five millimeter in the greatest dimension, basically the size of the grain of rice. And um, their colors are tanned. And most of the time they're embedded within the fat around the tissue, around the thyroid or um, at the neck. And they're very hard to identify. Blood supply, about 80% of uh, the individual will have the blood supply for all four glands will come from the inferior parathyroid, inferior uh, thyroidal artery. However, 20% uh, of uh, the population will have uh, the upper parathyroid gland supplied by the superior thyroid artery, okay? Um, so uh, what's a primary hyperparathyroidism? It's basically autonomous overproduction of parathyroid hormone by one or multiple parathyroid gland. And 85% of the time, we have a single adenoma that's overproducing the parathyroid hormone. The etiology, 90% of the time, they're sporadic. What, we don't know what the cause. There are other um, etiological factors like lithium-associated primary hyperthyroidism and exposure to radiation to the head and neck. And also it's associated with familial syndrome like MENA, uh, I mean, uh, one and two, and also hyperparathyroid jaw tumor um, uh, uh, syndrome. Um, a clinical presentation. Uh, we all heard about stones, bones, groans, and psychiatric overtones or uh, uh, moans. Basically, stones is kidney stones, bones is uh, bone pain or um, bone fracture. Uh, osteoporosis or osteopenia, groans, basically secondary to abdominal pain from either a peptic ulcer disease or pancreatitis, and psychiatric moan is the neurocognitive dysfunction. Those have been historical. And luckily in the 1970s, where the biochemical laboratory workup was done routinely, we tend to see those uh, presentation less and less. And the majority of the patient now are identified um, incidentally or during a workup for osteoporosis or um, uh, kidney stones. Um, the table on the right side, you can see those are the symptoms and uh, uh, the sign of uh, primary hyperparathyroidism. So how do we diagnose uh, primary hyperparathyroidism? It's a biochemical diagnosis. What it means is, if you do an ultrasound and you see a large parathyroid gland, that doesn't mean you have a primary hyperparathyroidism. You need to have elevated calcium and elevated uh, PTH level to have a primary hyperparathyroidism, okay? Uh, the other thing as part of the workup is you do a creatinine or renal function. You wanna check for the vitamin uh, D level because if you have a low vitamin D, you have low calcium absorption and hence higher BTH level to compensate. Um, there is an entity called normal calcimic hyperparathyroidism um, where the calcium is actually normal, but the BTH is high. Um, what you do is you check the ionized calcium, which basically will be uh, high. The other thing you would want to do is you want to do 24-hour urine um, uh, uh, calcium, uh, basically for two things. You want to see if there is you know, hyper excretion of calcium in the kidney, and also you want to rule out a familial hypocalcemic, hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, which we're going to discuss in the next few slides. So what are the indications uh, uh, indication for surgery? So age, if you're 50, less than 50 years of, uh, old, um, the latest guideline and the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons um, said if you're less than 50 years old, even if you're asymptomatic, you should have surgery. Their um, theory is basically you have longer time to develop complications, so you should have your surgery. Uh, the other uh, indication is serum calcium when you have one milligram per deciliter above normal. Uh, the, in our lab, we use the millimole, so anything more than 0.25 millimole above the normal uh, range. And also when you have bone problems, like when you have an osteoporosis or vertebral fracture, and kidney problems as well, where you have the creatinine clearance decrease, your 24-hour urine is above 400, which signify you're losing a lot of calcium, something needs to be done, or if you have uh, nephrolithiasis or nephrocalcinosis, is either you have a symptomatic or you find it incidentally. Uh, recently, there are people have pushing toward a neurocognitive and neuropsychiatric symptom as an indication for um, uh, 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 surgery. Um, so, um, indication for surgery again, 
Parathyroidectomy is the only definitive treatment for hyperparathyroidism. Medical treatments is only mitigate the problem, will not solve the problem. To get the cure, you need to have your abnormal parathyroid gland or glands removed. Observation or pharmacological therapy are less effective, less cost effective. Some of the medication are very expensive. And even with patients uh, who are considered asymptomatic, surgery are the best thing for the patient. So as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna talk about familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. The reason I put it here, you're gonna encounter some patient with mildly elevated calcium, normal or mildly elevated PTH, and uh, you would think he had a primary hyperparathyroidism. You always have to check for this because if you take one of those patients to the OR, you will do him no good because all the parathyroid gland will be normal. And surgery is not indi indicated for those uh, 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 patients. It's a rare autosomal dominant where you have the calcium sensoring receptor gene and the kidney are malfunctioning. And the patient basically also will have a hypermagnesemia and hypophosphatemia. Uh, so uh, once now we have diagnosed a patient with primary hyperparathyroidism, what's next? Localization study, okay? There's a lot of localization study. A lot of people are confused at which one the best, which one to do, which one, which combination to do. So one thing to take, the, the home take message from this slide is you need to know at least three of those uh, six uh, localization study. They are by no mean uh, conclusive, but there's also other uh, modality. But for the, for, for this lecture, we're only going to talk about briefly about those six. We're going to concentrate on the upper three. So for the sake of this lecture, you need to remember the ultrasound, system EB scan, and four-dimension uh, CT scan. Okay? We'll go uh, through each one of them uh, separately. So this is basically the ultrasound of the neck. And uh, as you can see, it has a specific feature, the uh, parathyroid uh, adenoma. You can see it's hypoechoic. Uh, here, the PTA is parathyroid adenoma. Uh, most of the time, it's posterior to the thyroid gland and has a solitary feeding vessel. The problem with the ultrasound is operator dependent. Not everybody is good at identifying them. So if you do it as a high, high volume center, you're more likely to uh, identify it. And the other downside is if you have mediastinal um, parathyroid adenoma, you are unable to identify it. When they did the meta-analysis, meta they looked at the pool sensitivity, which is pretty high, 76% uh, 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 with a positive predictive value around the 78 or 79. So why do we need to do an ultrasound? So every patient who's going to have a parathyroid surgery should have an ultrasound of the neck. Always, always. The reason is about 30 to 51% of patients going for parathyroidectomy will have some sort of thyroid pathology that need to be uh, evaluated or investigated before you take the patient to the operating uh, room. 30 to 50, so it's pretty high. So every single patient who is going to go for a, parathyroid, for a parathyroid surgery should have an ultrasound because of the concurrent thyroid disease. Um, basically, it will facilitate the most appropriate, appropriate index uh, operation, reduce complication, and avoid future reoperation. So Neck ultrasound, remember, always neck ultrasound. Always neck ultrasound when you evaluate a patient for uh, parathyroid, uh, primary, primary hyperparathyroidism. The other thing is the system EV or the radioisotope scintography. Um, as you can uh, see, there's multiple uh, modality of it. Uh, in the past, we used the, we, they used the, basically the Blanner uh, imaging. More, more, more recently, we've been using the single photon emission uh, computer tomography or the SPECT CT. Um, this has a very high sensitivity up to 80%. Uh, percent. So, this is the older version, and here you can see the newer uh, 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 technology where they combine the system EB with a CT scan, and you can see it's only DV3 dimensional. It's not, not, not just only the locate, the where, which, um, uh, which uh, side, all, also tell you the depth, the location with regard to the neck uh, structure. So the other new modality, well, now it's not a new modality. It's been up there since 2007. Uh, initially was used by a group of um, 
uh, endocrine surgeon at the uh, MD Anderson, where they evaluated the CT scan, and they basically called it the 4D CT scan. It's basically, essentially, is a CT angiography, uh, where it combined the change of perfusion of contrast over time. Which, what it does is, we know the parathyroid, it will wash out the contrast pretty quickly. So they use this uh, characteristic in the parathyroid adenoma to identify the parathyroid. Um, it's to provide both anatomical and functional information. Um, issues availability. In the past, used not to be available. However, it's very available. Issues availability. In the past, used, they have failed localization and we were lucky to find the culprit parathyroid uh, adenoma. As you can see, the pool sensitivity is about 10% higher than the ultrasound and the system EB. Um, uh, and the system EB uh, 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 scan with positive predictive value up to 91 to 93. So um, just, just a quick exercise here. Basically, this is actually a real uh, patient of mine um, who have failed uh, to localize the parathyroid uh, adenoma. Um, I'll give you about 10 seconds to spot it. Okay. As you can see here, basically this is the arterial base. You can see, take up the contrast pretty quickly, similar to the carotid vessels, and then washed out very fast, okay? The patient had a successful surgery. Uh, the other thing we can use the MRI, it's basically rarely indicated, uh, poor sensitivity, and um, you use it when uh, exposure to radiation is not um, um, wanted in a pregnant patient or in a young, um, uh, 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 young uh, uh, patient, uh, uh, and a young patient. The other thing which is, has been a new modality that has been in the market in the past now three years, something called PET-CT scan with contrast using the 18F fluorocholine. Um, recent study have showing the highest sensitivity for detecting um, basically parathyroid adenoma, especially ectopic. I'll give you again a few seconds if you can see, if you can spot the parathyroid adenoma. This is actually a real patient of mine who have had surgery, failed the surgery, had a CT scan, had a system EV, had an ultrasound, all has been negative. Then we did the 18F uh, fluorocholine, and then as you can see here, and in the mediastinum, the patient had a VATS uh, parathyroidectomy by thoracic surgeon and had sexual surgery. So just to give you an overview of all the different modality, you can see the planner system EB, the older version, the spec CT, and then the 18 fluorocholine. And you can see, you can basically see the quality of the image and how you basically able to localize the ectopic or the missing parathyroid adenoma. All right, so the last but not the least is the selective venous sampling. Um, basically, it's an invasive modality. You enter the vessels through the groin, you cannulate the basically thyroid veins, and you take samples, and you look for a gradient. So this is basically reserved for patients who have failed all modality, for patients who had a previous surgery, and then, um, uh, uh, it will basically help you localize which side is the missing parathyroid gland. All right, so now um, the question come up is the choice of localization study. So now we have a patient who had a primary hyperparathyroidism and we want to do a localization study. Which localization would you do? All right, so as we mentioned, always, always you're going to have an ultrasound is either you can use a system EB scan or you can have neck ultrasound and a 4D CT scan, okay? So minimum, either neck ultrasound and system EB or neck ultrasound with a 4D CT scan, okay? That's minimum. And then you have localized the parathyroid, you're gonna take the patient to surgery. The question comes up as, are you gonna do a focused parathyroidectomy? or you're gonna do a bilateral neck exploration. Focused parathyroidectomy is basically just go to the a culprit gland and remove it, okay? Um, this is the way I like it. I think it's, for me, that's the way 
I have been trained. I like to do it. I know other surgeons prefer the bilateral neck exploration. They have pretty much similar outcomes when it comes to cure uh, uh, rate with a slight less complication with the focused parathyroidectomy. The reason I like it is limited dissection. You don't have to do a lot of dissection. Patient essentially can go home from the recovery. You don't even have to admit the patient. Um, less complication. You do less dissection, less injury, less nerve injury, and less complication. And then, as you can see in the picture, you can do pretty like small incision. Um, bilateral neck exploration, what it entails basically, you try to identify all the four glands to compare them and uh, deduce the presence of a single adenoma, double adenoma, or MGD is a multi gland disease, which is beyond the scope of this lecture. It's a total entity that's, I'm not going to discuss it because it will, will, you know, will confuse a lot of people. So um, for me, you know, when do I use it? When I have non localized preoperative imaging, uh, when I have discordant preoperative uh, imaging, when I think there is a high suspicion of multi gland disease, or when I'm doing the operation for a patient with secondary hyperparathyroidism. And surgeon discretion sometimes, some surgeon would prefer to do from the get go the bilateral neck exploration. All right, so now you decided to do a focused parathyroidectomy or bilateral neck exploration, okay? And parathyroid surgery could be a five, it could be like 20 minute procedure or it could be five hour procedure, okay? So that people have tried to identify multiple ways to make the surgery as simple as possible. And all comes to basically planning your surgery and using as much Adjunct, adjunct to surgery to make it simple. And one of uh, the few things um, I, sh you sh I, sh I would recommend for everyone to use is intraoperative PTH monitor, the Miami criteria, which we're going to discuss in the next few slides. I personally use nerve monitor and um, I use intraoperative ultrasound uh, as well. Okay, so for me, I use intraoperative PTH, and if you want to do a parathyroid surgery, you should use intraoperative PTH monitoring, and I'll explain to you why in the next few slides. Nerve monitor, it's under your discretion, but if you can prevent one nerve injury using it, uh, even though the literature has not supported it, uh, I would still use it. And intraoperative ultrasound, okay? And then I will go how I would do the surgery as well uh, at the end of this uh, part of the lecture. The other thing you need to be aware that it's, you should do it, confirmation of parathyroid tissue, because you know, the parathyroid tissue could be pretty small, could look like a fat tissue, could be a lymph node. So the way to do it, to confirm it's a parathyroid, you take a, the specimen, you take a piece of the specimen and send it for frozen section. There's other things, um, I'm not sure if it's available in Kuwait. Um, we basically take the gland, we aspirate some uh, fluid, and then we send it for PTHSA, and it will give you 1,000, and that will confirm the parathyroid um, uh, adenoma within the gland, like that the specimen is a parathyroid gland. Uh, there's other modalities. Some people use methanol blue, autofluorescence. Um, you can read about it, but for the sake of the exam, you should know intraoperative PTH monitoring, the Miami criteria, okay? And... If you're confused, you don't know what you're moving, always remember there's a frozen section, okay? All right, so now we're gonna talk about the Miami criteria for intraoperative PTH monitoring. It's basically um, developed by George Arban at the University of Miami in the uh, 1990. Uh, and it's basically all based about on the half-life of the PTH. It's about four and a half minutes. So basically, if you remove the gland in four and a half minutes, your PTH level should go back to normal, okay? So what George Arvine proposes, if you have more than 50% drop of your PTH at 10 minutes after removing the parathyroid adenoma or adenome or multi-gland disease, then your chance of having normal calcemia post-op is actually 98%, okay? Um, so, as you can see here, the way you do it, before you make an incision, you send um, parathyroid hormone level. 
And then when you identify the parathyroid adenoma, before you excise it, you send pre-excision level. And then once you remove it, you wait for five minutes and 10 minutes and you send two levels, okay? And you should see more than 50% drop, okay? Some people have modified it to actually the PTH to drop to normal before you conclude the surgery. Uh, so as you can see in this diagram on the left side, this is on the right, this is George Arvine. Um, so you do a pre-excision, it's 80, and then you do a pre-incision, a pre and then you do a pre-excision, five and 10 minutes. And then your baseline is the higher of the two, of the pre-incision and pre-excision, okay? That should be your baseline for the drop. As you can see in this diagram, there's 77 drop, okay, from the 150. So here you do, this is your baseline one and baseline two. You choose whichever is higher and then you calculate your drop, okay? And you can see here 35, which is 77%, okay? All right. Now, this will take us back to ectopic parathyroid adenoma. The reason I put this here, not with the anatomy, because before you go into, uh, before you do a parathyroid surgery, always you should review this slide, okay? You should know if you have a missing gland, where to identify it. And you can see here, they could be basically anywhere in the neck, okay? Anywhere in the neck. What I mean here, if you could not find the gland and then you find three glands, okay? And the missing gland is the superior gland, and instead of blindly looking for the missing gland, if it's superior, then you know where to look. You're gonna look at the tracheostomial group, posterior mediastinum, or retroesophageal or parapharyngeal uh, areas, okay? If it's inferior, well, it's a bigger uh, deal. Uh, the way you're gonna start, you're gonna look at the thyrothymic ligament, which is the ligament to connect the inferior thyroid uh, pole to the thymus. You're gonna pull the thymus and look in the thymus. You're gonna open the carotid sheath. And if you're unlucky, it's very deep in the mediastinum and you cannot identify it, or it's intrathyroidal. And here where you can do intraoperative ultrasound and identify it, okay? All right, so now briefly, I'm gonna talk about um, how I would do a focused parathyroidectomy. Um, patients will be placed in the semi follower position with a bump under the shoulder to extend the neck. I avoid overextending the neck. I think it helps with postoperative pain. So far, none of my patients have complained of shoulder pain. Before you start the surgery, make sure you have good access because you're gonna be drawing multiple blood sample, okay? Even if you need, you can place an arterial axis to get your intraoperative PTH, okay? Because the last thing is you wanna do is you identify the gland and then you don't have a good axis and then you're gonna spend 30 minutes trying to get an axis. All right, um, before incision, I always do my neck ultrasound. It will help me with placing the incision. It will help me identify where is the gland exactly. If there's any other pathology I overlooked from the chart, okay? And then I always um, uh, use the intraoperative PTH monitoring, Miami criteria, okay? And then I would send the pre-incision. After the prepped and draped, I would send one level. It's called pre-incision. Then you will make a transverse central incision, try to identify natural skin freeze for optimal cosmetic result. The incision between three to five, you can do it less. Uh, so far I do three to five. I use local anesthetics. And then, I do very limited subletismal flap, unlike with the thyroid, where you have to go all the way to the cracoid, um, uh, to the thyroid cartilage and to the sternum and uh, laterally to the sternocleidomastoid. Very limited um, subletismal flap. And then on with the median raphe uh, uh, vertically. Then identify the middle thyroid vein. I divide it. As you can see in the picture here, the middle thyroid vein was uh, uh, divided. And this basically will help you mobilize the thyroid gland medially, as you can see, I use a peanut and the thyroid gland is rotated medially. Uh, and then also we'll explore the carotid sheet just in case you need to look into the carotid sheet, okay? Once the abnormal parathyroid gland is identified, you're gonna do your intraoperative uh, BTH monitoring. So now 
you're going to do the pre-excision before you excise it. You do a pre-excision PTH level and you send it to the lab. And then after you excise the gland, you do a post-excision five and then post-excision 10 minute level. Okay. If you have any doubt about the tissue you removed, always send the frozen section because believe it or not, lymph node, thyroid nodule would sometimes look exactly like a parathyroid. And a lot of people, including me, have been fooled. And then a closure and layer. Um, so what do you do after you complete your surgery? Post-operative care and follow-up. Um, you do a serum PTH, calcium, uh, uh, PTH and calcium level in recovery. So you wanna make sure that your calcium, your PTH, most importantly, is back to normal because you don't want to send the patient up and then identify that it's still high and then you have to take the patient down. And then if the patient decided to stay the night in the hospital, I would do, again, 6 a.m. calcium and PTH level. Patients start normal diet as soon as they can tolerate uh, PO, only pain medication, calcium supplementation, aggressive in the first few weeks, some of them will develop hypocalcemia either because the other glands are not fully functional or they have long-standing hyperparathyroidism that they develop a hungry bone syndrome. Plus minus calcitriol, it's, we have it in Kuwait as one alpha. A patient will follow up 10 to 14 days post-surgery with repeated calcium and BTH level. And then again, I would check the calcium and BTH level at six months. All right. Uh, Post-operative complication, hypocalcemia, either because the other gland is not working or the patient has been hypocalcemic for a long time that they have developed hungry bone um, uh, syndrome, neck hematoma, nerve injury, trachea injury, and a subgeal injury, similar to what you have with any um, uh, uh, neck uh, surgery. So that will bring us to other things that they like to ask in the exam, okay? And I think you should know. What's a cure? What's a persistent? What's a recurrent hyperparathyroidism? Cure, you consider it cured if you have normal calcemia that lasting more than six months, okay? If your calcium level normal for more than six months with your PTH, then you're cured, okay? What's persistent, okay? Persistent is basically after the surgery, your calcium is high and your PTH is high, okay? For any, any time before six months from the surgery. Recurrence, on the other hand, where you have an interval of normal calcemia, and then after six months, you develop recurrence, okay? For those two entities, if you don't do a lot of parathyroid surgery, you should not be managing those patients. Surgeries are very difficult, and uh, very hard uh, surgery and complications are very high. All right, parathyroid pearls okay if you decided after your uh, residency to do a parathyroid surgery obtain two concordant localization study before performing surgery okay if you don't have two localization study think twice before you take the patient to the operating room a 20 minute procedure could be in could be a six hour procedure with significant comorbidities always always use intraoperative pth monitoring <laughs> Always remember the Miami criteria. I, I get it, sometimes it's not ideal, but it saved the patient uh, from having another surgery. Okay, and then the most common location for a missing gland is actually a normal anatomical position, okay? And then if the patient had a previous surgery, parathyroid or thyroid surgery, and now have primary hyperparathyroidism, you should not be doing the surgery if you are not a high volume surgeon. Okay, just to put everything into together, uh, to perspective, okay? We're gonna have a case, we're gonna go through it. I'm not gonna ask questions, I'm just gonna go through it. So to put everything together. Okay, you have a 40 years old uh, a male who was referred to you with elevated calcium level. What would you do next? Okay, calcium, and PTH, well, you take a history, to try to identify an indication for surgery, and the patient have kidney stone. You want to send a, a serum calcium repeated and a PTH, renal profile, uh, vitamin D, and 24-hour urine calcium. Once you confirm your diagnosis, we know 
primary hyperparathyroidism, it's a biochemical diagnosis, okay? So once you confirm your diagnosis, what's next? You're gonna decide on localization study, okay? Localization study, as we mentioned earlier, always, always, always do an ultrasound with either CESTA-AV or 4D uh, CT scan, okay? So you do, a, uh, you do a localization study, it reveals left inferior parathyroid adenoma. What would you do next? Okay, focused parathyroidectomy, okay? Giving the patient age and has a kidney stone, he has two indications for surgery, I would do focused parathyroidectomy, okay? Always use intraoperative PTH monitoring Miami criteria. Okay. All right, so that's conclude the first part of the um, uh, lecture. And then we'll leave those questions toward the end of the second lecture, okay? All right, now we're gonna move on to second part of the lecture, which is basically adrenal incidentaloma, okay? Adrenal masses, there is so much to talk about. I picked one topic that you're gonna be encounter during your practice, and they like to ask it in the exam, adrenal incidentaloma, okay? So objective of this lecture, overview of the anatomy of the adrenal gland, What's adrenal incidentaloma? Uh, differential diagnosis for adrenal incidentaloma. Overview how to work up a patient with adrenal mass. Surgical management adrenal mass. Preoperative consideration for patient with functional adrenal mass. Postoperative care for patient with uh, uh, for patient undergoing uh, adrenalectomy. All right. So we already went through those questions. Okay, we'll move on to the anatomy. As we know, the adrenal is basically formed from the formed by two uh, different uh, embryological components: the cortex, which basically encompasses eighty to ninety percent of the normal um, gland, whereas the medulla is only ten to twenty percent. Cortex has three zones: the glomerulosa, fasciculata, and reticularis. Okay, the fasciculata is the, basically the largest and reduced glucocorticoid. Medulla is the inner part, which is covered by the cortex and entirely formed of uh, chromophian uh, uh, cells. So the right gland is triangular. Um, uh, triang uh, the right is triangular or pyramidal in shape. The left is semilunar. Blood supply come from the superior, middle, and inferior adrenal uh, artery, which basically come from uh, phrenic, aorta, and renal artery. Uh, there's some other vessels you will encounter, um, which is very consistent, the intercostal and the left gonadal uh, vessel. Venous drainage, which is very important. One of the most important things about the adrenal gland is the venous drainage. The left side is uh, it drains to the left adrenal vein, and the right side, very, very short. It's, it's like half a centimeter in some cases, very, very small, and it drains directly to the IBC, which make the surgery one mistake patients could exanguinate. All right, so adrenal incidentaloma. Okay, the widespread of cross-sectional imaging like CT scan, MRI, PET scan, all those things led to us identifying about 1% of those images will have some sort of adrenal incidentaloma. Why it's so important for surgeon? Well, to verify this is actually mass within the adrenal gland, determine the lesion if it's functional or non-functional, and why there is malignant or uh, not. Okay, so the differential diagnosis, you know, divided into functional, non-functional, and malignant. We'll go through like most of them within, in the next few slides. Um, uh, basically, this pie chart show the majority of incidentaloma, up to 60%. Some of the uh, uh, literature says actually up to 80% are non-functional. 10% um, of them few chromocytoma, uh, about 5% um, uh, cortisol producing, and 1% uh, uh, aldosterone, and um, about 5% actually um, uh, uh, cancer. All right, so we'll start with FIU chromocytoma. About 40, 30 to 40% of uh, FIU actually found incidentally. Um, when you further take history from the patient, you'll identify patient have been having hypertension that has been difficult to manage. 
and the patient will tell spells-like symptoms. They will have palpitation, headache, sweating, and anxiety. And then um, part of the screening, what we do is plasma fractionating methanephrine level and a 24-hour urine methanephrine, okay? The first one is very, very sensitive. The second one is very, very specific, okay? Uh, imaging study uh, and CT scan, they tend to be heterogeneous, high attenuation, most, the majority of them actually more than three centimeter and then they have a high house field unit, more than uh, uh, 10. And MRI, they're white and T2 weighted uh, images. Okay, and uh, basically this is just an image showing you um, the few chromocytoma, as you can see, heterogeneous, high attenuation. You can see there's a lot of contrast uh, in it. And then the house field unit, I, I bet is more than 10. Okay, the other uh, entity is subclinical Cushing syndrome, which basically you have autonomous cortisol secretion in the absence of overt sign of Cushing syndrome. A study of uh, 1,400 incident teloma found about 8% to have subclinical uh, Cushing uh, uh, syndrome. History patients will have hypertension, diabetes, op uh, obesity, um, uh, compared with other patients with incident teloma. Uh, screening. There is, uh, you can do low dose dexamethasone suppression test or um, uh, 24 hour urine cortisol level or salivary, a midnight salivary cortisol that I did not include it here. Again, uh, for localization, you would do a CT and MRI um, of the uh, abdomen. And that will bring us to the aldosteronoma. Um, basically, is the most common hypersecreting adrenal lesion, not Incidentuloma, just in general, is the most active, most common secreting adrenal lesion. Um, is the most is the most common cause of secondary hypertension, about eight to twelve uh, percent. Uh, lesion typically is very small, like majority of them actually less than one point five centimeter, which makes it very hard to identify with the CT scan, even with thin uh, uh, images. Um, history, they have a typical history of difficult to control hypertension. And by the time it's worked up, patient on multiple antihypertensive medication, and um, a lot of them will have hypokalemia, but not all. Um, how to screen for them? You do plasma, aldosterone activity, and renin, uh, and renin uh, ratio, and should be more than 20, uh, 20, uh, 20. And then you can do a confirmatory test with 24-hour uh, urine uh, aldosterone um, with salt loading. Either give them salt or give them uh, uh, saline. Imaging study, you do a CT and MRI and selective venous sampling, which there is a specific indication for selective venous sampling. Okay, and then that will bring us to the benign non-functional adrenal uh, uh, cortical uh, adenoma. Uh, as mentioned in the previous uh, few slides, they are the most common lesion uh, found as an incidentaloma. Most of them are actually less than four centimeter. Patients are completely asymptomatic like from the lesion. Uh, screening, they will have negative biochemical workup. And then as you can see here, the CT scan show non-functional cortical uh, adenoma. They tend to have low house field units, so less than uh, 10. And then they also tend to have a washout, um, more than basically 50%, depends if they use the absolute or the uh, relative. Okay, so the other benign functioning adrenal lesion, we have myelolipoma, they are benign. They tend to be actually very large and they are asymptomatic. They will have a negative biochemical workup. Um, imaging with the CD and MRI will have microscopic uh, uh, fat, okay? And then management is basically no surgery. Just leave them alone unless there's a question about malignancy or the patient is symptomatic from them. As you can see here, a large one, you can, you know, comfortably manage it conservatively. Okay, and then that will bring us to the malignant adrenal lesion, adrenal carcinoma. Typically, they are more than six centimeter. I count between one to eight percent of incident teloma, average five percent. Majority of them actually functional, and they produce cortisol as the most common uh, secreting uh, adrenal or uh, endocrine hormone, followed by aldosterone and uh, androgen. Most patients have a clinical uh, symptom, hypertension, diabetes, virilization, weight loss, um, screening. They will have a, you know, 60% of them will have a positive biochemical 
uh, workup, uh, imaging study, we have CT scan and MRI, and pretty uh, obvious you can um, pick it up with the imaging. As you can see here, this mass basically is huge, has no plane to the surrounding structure, looks like it's invading the surrounding uh, uh, structure. Okay, uh, and then the other thing that we should think of is also adrenal metastasis, about 2.5 of incident tuloma actually metastasize. Uh, lung, breast, stomach, kidney cancer, and mineraloma are most commonly metastasized to the adrenal uh, gland. And from the history, um, you should basically inquire about a history of malignancy, and expected fever or weight loss. Um, screening by chemical workup, the majority will have a negative, and the CT scan will have heterogeneous, irregular border, and 10 to 15 percent have a bilateral. Okay, as you can see here, this is an adrenal uh, metastasis with a patient, I think, I believe it's with lung uh, cancer. Okay, so uh, this slide will summarize how to manage. If the patient has a functional adenoma or has carcinoma that's basically resectable, then surgery is the way to go, okay? Non-functional adenoma, if it's more than four centimeter, patient should have a adrenectomy, less than four centimeter, you would surveil the patient, okay? Myelolipoma, no surgery, unless atypical feature. So preoperative consideration. All adrenal masses, you need to do a preoperative DVT prophylaxis, you, um, plus minus chemical uh, anticoagulation. I do give patient heparin before induction. Sorry. And uh, consider preoperative antibiotic. If the patient is uh, cortisol reducing adenoma, adequate uh, treatment of the hypertension and preoperative uh, peptic ulcer prophylaxis. And then for a few chromocytoma, you will alpha blockade followed by beta blockade. And following the surgery, 16% uh, of them will have uh, recurrence. So you need to surveil those, patient, the, uh, those patients. Okay. Uh, Post-operative consideration, all patients should have uh, DVT prophylaxis. For cortisol producing adenoma, uh, uh, as you know, if you have adrenal, if you have cortisol producing adenoma, the other or the contralateral adrenal that will be suppressed for a long time. So we need to have some sort of uh, cortical uh, re replacement and you need to basically involve your endocrinologist in the management of um, uh, those patients postoperatively to avoid Addisonian crisis. Uh, Fee chromocytoma, uh, patients um, need to be placed in a high dependency unit or uh, ICU postoperatively because uh, a lot of them will have uh, some sort of hypotension uh, rebound hypertension, and also you need to check their uh, blood glucose uh, level as a lot of them will have a surge of insulin and they will go hypoglycemic. Okay, so basically this, um, what uh, we talked about in the, few, in the previous uh, slide about adrenal incidentuloma, that's uh, summarized the whole thing. If you have an adrenal incidentuloma, you need to do two things, basically, biochemical evaluation and radiological assessment, okay? You need to rule out um, aldosterone, uh, hyperaldosteronism in a patient with hypertension, if the patient has hypertension, you need to rule out subclinical um, uh, caution uh, 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 syndrome, and also you want to rule out pheochromocytoma. Okay. If the patient has a functional lesion, then the decision is easy. Uh, Preoperative consideration depends what uh, hormone is produced and the patient will have adrenalectomy. If the patient have non-functional lesion, then you have to uh, repeat um, the images if it's less than four centimeter, uh, three to six months, uh, and then yearly for one to two years. And then also, you also wanna um, reorder the bi biochemical uh, uh, workup, okay? And then radiological assessment uh, as well, uh, which we briefly discussed uh, 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 earlier. All right. So those questions, we already went uh, uh, through them. Okay. 
Now, um, this is a clinical uh, scenario. Um, if any of the BGY5 who's interested in taking up this question. We have uh, our, our residents uh, online. Uh, we have Dr. Sarah Safi. Okay. Okay, um, Dr. Sarah. Uh, you are evaluating a 39 years old female with a biochemical diagnosis of hyperparathyroidism that was found during workup for osteoporosis. How would you manage this patient? So uh, I would start with history and physical examination. Mm -hmm. uh, I will send uh, further biochemical workup, including um, parathyroid hormone, uh, I will repeat the calcium level as well. I will send, I will do a renal profile and uh, I will send for 24 hour urine uh, creatinine, uh, 24 hour urine calcium levels. And I assume that she did already the osteoporosis uh, scan. Okay. So we would have the results for that as well. Okay, so let's see how many of those you get right. Okay, as you mentioned, um, you want to take a history and physical, uh, looking for any uh, 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 symptom, uh, family history, patients adopted, any previous neck surgery, um, and then repeat the labs, as you mentioned correctly, and then you want to do a localization study, correct? You did not yes. mention the localization study. No, I'll I didn't. Okay, I'll give it to you. All right, so you repeat the lab, and that's what you see. Calcium is elevated, BTH is elevated, creatinine is normal, 24 hour urine is elevated. I'm sorry, I have a lag on my uh, okay. screen, so I cannot see the lab results. But how high? So yes, elevated. I can see it. Yes, I can see it now. Okay, so this patient has a, a primary hyperparathyroidism with a 24 hour urinary calcium more than 400 that goes with uh, uh, the diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism. So now I will do a localizing uh, scans. I will start with ultrasound neck and okay. followed by a system EB scan. Okay. For this patient. All right. Okay, so this is your ultrasound. Okay. So I can, uh, there is a hypoechoic uh, lesion uh, near the uh, left, sorry, a right carotid uh, artery. This one here? Yes. Okay. No, no, the, no, the one with the... This one here? No, this is the vessel. So the one above it. This one here? Yeah. This one here, yes. Okay. Um, Showed sure, there's a homogeneous texture to it, uh, no cystic components. Um, from the dimensions, it's measuring one by 1.5 centimeter in diameter, I would assume. Okay. Okay. All right. So, do you think this is a? Do you think this is a parathyroid adenoma? Uh, it could be a part of the thyroid lobe. So I need to do a further imaging uh, to see whether okay. this is uh, the thyroid lobe or this is the adenoma. Okay. So you, you did also system EB scan and this yes. is your system EB scan. So there is an uptick. Uh, there is a normal uptick in the thyroid scan. And then there is uh, on the image uh, C, there is a left, uh, left inferior. Uh, uptake okay. uh, or uh, left inferior parathyroid uh, uptake that might go with a adenoma, parathyroid okay. adenoma. Okay. So what do you want to do next? So uh, I will counsel the patient uh, okay. that she needs uh, surgical uh, removal of her parathy the parathyroid adenoma uh, okay. to do a parathyroidectomy for her. Okay. Uh, I will, uh, we said that she didn't have any previous neck surgeries. Um, nope, no, she did not. No. Okay, so I will, uh, I can send the patient for a parathyroidectomy. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and uh, I will uh, check her vitamin D levels. If it's low, then I will give her vitamin D supplements. Also, I will do a vocal cord assessment, either subjective or objective assessment. Okay. Uh, then I will book the patient for OT for a minimal invasive surgery or minimal okay. invasive parathyroid Okay. Let's see what I did for this patient. This is actually a real patient, okay? And this is a real story. All right. So, unlike you, I was not happy with the ultrasound. Okay. Okay. And the system EV scan. So, I did a 4D CT scan. Okay. Okay. And this is what we saw, okay? Okay. What do you see here? So there is the, so on the right uh, lobe of the thyroid and the posterior aspect of it, there is uh, in the non-contrast phase, there is a hypoechoic lesion. And then with the contrast phase, uh, it's uh, hyper uh, enhancing. Then with the, with the washout, it's, uh, Heterogeneous. And okay, so it's basically it's the the R tells you where is it. Okay, so yes, we thought this is the parathyroid. This is the parathyroid. This is the parathyroid. Then you can see you no know, contrast, contrast, and fast washout. Okay, so this is the okay. culprit gland, right? Yes. Okay. So what would you do next? You said you would do minimal invasive, um, or we call it focused parathyroidectomy with intraoperative monitoring, okay? Okay. All right. Intraoperatively, you identify a mass that is about 0.5 centimeter inferior to the left thyroid lobe. What would you do at this point? So at this point, uh, we will send a parathyroid uh, hormone level, mm -hmm. uh, pre-excision. Pre then okay. after uh, excision of the parathyroid, we sent uh, at five, five minutes and 10 minutes uh, parathyroid hormone levels to assess if there is uh, a drop in the baseline uh, parathyroid levels. Okay. okay. All right. So we'll see. All right. Correct. You do a pre-excision PTH level. You excise the gland. You do post excision five and ten minutes, and then your surgery is over. Huh? Uh, okay. I need to wait for your yes. Um, okay. All right. So you you did that, and those are the levels. So there's not uh, there is no significant drop in the post excision uh, at five and ten minutes level compared to the pre excision. Uh, so I can do uh, uh, further, uh, I can use further adjuncts, such as sending the sample to frozen section to assess whether this is a parathyroid adenoma or not. Mm -hmm. And if, it's, if there is availability, then we will do uh, intraparathyroid parathyroid, uh, sampling for PTH okay. to assess the level of the PTH with sim simultaneous uh, serum PTH level to assess uh, Okay, so what would be your next step? Um, so you said you want to send for frozen section? Yes. You sent for frozen section and it's not parathyroid. What would okay, you do next? So, so I will do a bilateral neck exploration, okay. looking for uh, ectopic uh, functioning parathyroid uh, adenoma. Okay. And also I will explore the uh, other glands. Okay, good. So exactly, that's what we're gonna do. So things not right here. You can see the pre-incision, pre-excision, post-excision, you know, they went down a little bit and then went up. So whatever you removed was not the parathyroid. Okay. Okay, during the bilateral neck exploration, you identify right superior and inferior and left superior parathyroid gland. However, you were not able to identify the left inferior gland. What would you do next? So I would uh, explore uh, 
for ectopic uh, uh, position of the left inferior gland. So I will look. Uh, uh, I will look if it is embedded in the thyroid itself. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, also, I will explore the thymus to check for uh, uh, an ectopic position for it. Okay. And uh, and that's it. Okay, so correct. So that's what we do. And so it's very. That's why embryology and you know which gland is missing is very important. Otherwise, it's like trying to find um, basically a needle, um, like or you try to find like a, a piece of uh, try to find a drop of water in the sea, basically. And um, as you can see, the previous slide I showed you could be basically anywhere in the neck. So you need to narrow down your search. So this patient has a missing inferior parathyroid adenoma. So the most common location is the thyrothymic ligament or the thymus. So that's where you should be looking. If you can't find it there, you would open the carotid sheet and you would look for it. And again, if it's in the anterior mediastinum very deep, you're not going to find it no matter what, unless you do a median sternotomy, and you should not do a median sternotomy um, at the, if you were not planning before the surgery. And sometimes it's actually embedded in the thyroid, as you mentioned, and could be intrathyroidal, and that's where the ultrasound, intraoperative ultrasound, come in handy. Okay. So now, after you examined all possible ectopic location, you're still unable to find the missing gland. What would you do next? Uh, I will. I will conclude the, the procedure, and then I will anything do. A, sorry. Anything else you would do? Oh, sorry. Uh, Yes, there is another uh, option. You can uh, do uh, intraoperative venous sampling to okay. check uh, uh, in the, through the jugular vein to check whether uh, for the PTH level uh, to check if there's uh, uh, any... Uh, sorry? To check for laterality. Yes, Which... for laterality. If okay. it is unavailable, then I will uh, uh, conclude the procedure, and then I'll do uh, re-imaging and re-localization re re post-op to assess for uh, uh, further ectopic, uh, uh, to assess for other sites that I did not explore, as we said, uh, pericardium and uh, other areas. Okay. All right. So, exactly. You would conclude the surgery and perform localization study three to six months after um, the index surgery, okay? Also, do not perform a blind thyroid lobectomy, okay? I know you can find it in the books, but do not perform blind thyroid lobectomy thinking that you're gonna find it. If you have an ultrasound, if you just put an ultrasound over the thyroid, you would find that there is uh, intrathyroid and parathyroid, okay? All right. Um, so that's conclude the first clinical scenario, and then we'll move on to the next clinical scenario. Any of the chiefs that would want to volunteer? Uh, let me check uh, who's available. Thank you, Dr. Sara, for participating. Thank you so much. It helps when you spend some time in the endocrine service, endocrine <laughs> surgery service. Yes, a lot. <laughs> we have... Uh, Dr. Farraj Al Hajri available. Okay. He's uh, joining in. Hello, hi, Dr. Saman. Uh, hello, Farraj, how are you? Uh, good to, to connect with you again. And um, mm -hmm. actually, the previous case, uh, everyone, is actually a real case. This is a real case. Okay. <coughs> All right, okay, uh, Fred, you ready? Yeah. Okay, you are evaluating a 26 years old female with a left adrenal incident teloma measuring four centimeter. How would you work up this patient? Uh, first, I'll take uh, history and uh, physical examination 
I'll uh, assess how uh, they, she was diagnosed with incidental, uh, incidental loma, adrenal incidental loma, and what was uh, the damage she did and what uh, she was complaining of. And uh, the history will be brought if she complained of anything that she noticed uh, the last few weeks or months. And uh, I'll do a full examination of the abdomen. And then I'll do my uh, biochemical workup. I'll uh, uh, order for routine labs, uh, CBC, RFT, LFT. I'll ask for uh, plasma and metanephrine. Uh, I'll check for uh, cortisol level uh, and plasma. And I'll ask for uh, aldosterone uh, renin ratio. And uh, <coughs> I'll check. Uh, the image she did that, uh, if it's CT, I will uh, look for a characteristic of the, of the CT image of the adrenal mass. And uh, I will check if it's uh, hypochoic, if, uh, how much is the uh, house field. And uh, if, there is, uh, if there is a regular border of the mass or if there's any invasion. Uh, and uh, then I'll proceed. To... Okay. So, correct, as you said, um, history and physical. The patient tells you she has spill-like symptom, symptoms, palpitation, headache, sweating, and anxiety. Um, she was newly diagnosed with hypertension that she's been having difficulty managing it uh, with her um, primary care physician. Um, and as you mentioned uh, correctly, you would do a biochemical workup uh, to a lot of chromocytoma, subclinical Cushing, and hyperaldosteronism, and then your localization study, okay? So uh, as you can see in the slide, this is your um, biochemical workup. Yeah, uh, it's going with the biochromocytoma, and uh, in the CT, there is a round mass uh, the right above the right kidney, uh, hyper enhancing. Uh, I will check a uh, house field. Uh, how much is it? It's more than 10. Okay. Uh, I will look for any invasion or any sites uh, other than uh, the right kidney. Uh, and then uh, <coughs> I'll proceed with further management. Okay. All right. So, what would you do next? Um, I will counsel the patient uh, that I will tell her that her hypertension and her symptoms are most likely from the tumor. Uh, and she is diagnosed with biochromocytoma. And we can offer, uh, offer uh, right adrenochromy uh, to offer her cure of her disease. Okay. So, when are you going to do the surgery? Uh, first, I have uh, to prepare the patient for the surgery. Uh, I'll have to give her uh, alpha blocker four weeks uh, prior to surgery, and uh, I will make sure that she was seen by the anesthesia uh, to control her uh, blood pressure, and she is uh, taking uh, alpha blocker. Okay. Anything else you would consider? Uh, Obviously, okay. I shouldn't be giving you leading questions. You should actually, you know, say those yourself. But this is just a, a teaching. Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. Okay. All right. So you would start with alpha blockade, either phenexabenzamine or brazosine, terazosine. And then once um, the blood pressure and heart rate is adequately controlled. Sometimes the heart rate is not controlled. You could always add a beta blockade. And then your goal is basically, you wanna have orthostatic hypertension. That's, this is when you know the patient is actually kind of ready for the uh, 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 surgery, okay? So your goal is the blood pressure, a sitting should be less than 130 over 80. And then sitting, the systolic blood pressure should be less than uh, 100, okay? Orthostatic hypertension. Okay. The other thing is you always want to volume replete those patients. 
So what you tell the patient is, uh, at home, drink, like eat a lot of salt and drink a lot of water because when you have pheochromocytoma, your um, uh, venous system basically is completely constricted. So you don't have anything. By the time you remove the, the uh, uh, pheochromocytoma, what's going to happen is your venous uh, system will basically going to dilate and then suddenly you're hypotensive. Okay, so you need to fill those spaces before um, uh, the surgery. Okay? okay, all right. So, so the patient's cleared for surgery. How would you perform your adrenalectomy? The patient has left uh, adrenal gland. Okay, so uh, first I'll uh, prepare the patient and make sure that uh, she received the PTE prophylaxis and uh, she has a normal cough. Uh, I'll position the patient for open uh, adrenalectomy. Uh, so fine position. I'll, uh, <coughs> I'll uh, uh, make sure force is inserted and in the tube, and uh, I'll grip the patient uh, abdomen fully, and I will do uh, midline laparotomy incision. Uh, I'll open the subcutaneous and fascia. Uh, I will explore the abdomen fully, look for any masses, and then I'll uh, mobilize the splenic flexure, uh, then I'll uh, mobilize uh, the spleen from the lateral reporting. I, I might have to stop you here for a second. So the patient asks you specifically if you could do, if you could do the surgery laparoscopically. And yeah. So you said yes, you can do it laparoscopically. So how would you do the surgery laparoscopically? Uh, laparoscopy, I'll... Uh, uh, position the patient uh, at uh, uh, supine with the tilt of the left side, with the padding underneath the, the left, uh, the left uh, back. Uh, then I will, sort, I will insert my port, uh, uh, my main port uh, above the umbilicus, and. Uh, uh, I will try to insert the, to open the, the sheet and uh, go inside, uh, inside the abdomen to by open technique and insufflate uh, the abdomen. Then uh, I will uh, insert uh, uh, one port uh, to the gastric well, you area. You already you established a new peritoneum. How would you proceed? Uh, then I will insert the additional ports. Uh, All your are inserted. Pneumoperitoneum is established. Okay. Then uh, I'll uh, I'll uh, divide the, the greater momentum to enter the lateral sac, uh, and then uh, uh, I will divide the short uh, splenic uh, artery and. Uh, uh, I will find the space uh, between the, the, the underneath the, the pancreas and uh, the, between it and uh, the kidney. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure to be honest. I'm lost. All right. Okay. So let's say this patient had a right adrenal pheochromocytoma. You placed four trockers and now you're inside, you establish a new peritoneum and now you're there. What would you do? For the right side? Yes. Uh, mobilize uh, the liver, the right liver, the liver. I'll divide the right triangle ligaments. Uh, I'll mobilize the hepatic flexure. Uh, I will expose uh, the IBC. Uh, I will uh, identify the adrenal vein and uh, identify the adrenal gland and the kidney. I'll uh, then uh, divide. Uh, before that, I will do my uh, colorization the duodenum, and uh, I'll divide the adrenal vein and then. Uh, Try mobilize the adrenal from the kidney and 
triple CNN fax and then remove the specific. All right. Okay. Um, anything else you want to do? Let's say intraoperatively, as you mobilize the tumor, the patient becomes severely hypertensive. Uh, uh, Restate the patient with the uh, inotropes and fluids. And uh, hypertensive. Hypertensive. Sorry. Uh, I'll, uh, give the patient uh, Peter Proker and assess his uh, response. From a surgical point of view, you're scrubbed. You can't give this. Yeah. What could you do? I'll. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Okay. So you did a successful surgery. Uh, where are you going to place the patient? Uh, place in the ICU for monitoring uh, of the blood pressure. Okay. Anything else you want to monitor? Uh, I'll monitor for bleeding. So. All right, okay. Uh, so that's concluded. Actually, you did pretty well, um, apart from the surgery. You just need to brush up on how to do the adrenalectomy, okay? So, okay, so what you're gonna do is this. You're gonna do left adrenalectomy. You position the patient to the right lateral decuba, decubitus uh, position, okay? All pressure area should be adequately padded. You place three to four trocars, depends, and then you went into the wrong plane. You're not going to enter the lesser sac because to get into the adrenal through the lesser sac, you have to divide the pancreas, okay? The way is you're going to mobilize the spleen and the tail of the pancreas medially. To do so, sometimes you have to take the splenic flexure. You remove, divide all the splenic um, uh, ligaments and then get into the cleavage between the kidney and the tail of the pancreas, Okay. Doing so, you will identify the left adrenal vein, you clip it and you divide it, and all care should be taken not to rupture the tumor, okay? And um, with the chromocytoma, the only way we know if it's malignant, it's if we can see some sort of invasion. So if it's malignant and hasn't invaded and you rupture the tumor, then you turn the, turn the tumor in stage four um, uh, uh, cancer, basically, which is very unfavorable, okay? So, which is not wrong to do an open surgery, as you mentioned, okay? This is for the left side. For the right side, you're gonna place the patient opposite to this. It's gonna be to the left, lateral decubitus position, pressure area adequately padded, patient strapped to the bed, patient should have a Foley catheter inserted, should have the A line, central line, anesthesia should have seen the patient before, and the patient should be placed on a vasodilator, uh, pressors, uh, and, uh, uh, pressors, and then giving a lot of fluid, okay? Uh, for the right side, again, you're gonna enter four trockers because you need to retract the liver, okay? As you mentioned correctly, you're gonna divide the coronary and the triangular ligament to mobilize the right lobe of the liver. You're gonna identify the adrenal gland, identify the IVC, dissect free the uh, renal vein, on the right side, very, very short, very careful when you do the dissection, clip and then divide. Okay, yeah. uh, that's for the right side. The other uh, curveball I threw for you during this, what if while you mobilize the tumor, patient become hypertensive? And basically what you're doing, was, what happened is this is, you squeeze the tumor and then a lot of uh, basically adrenaline and noradrenaline has been released into the system. If you continue to do this, the patient will become more hypertensive and more hypertensive. So at this point in time, you should stop. Communicate with your anesthesia. Make sure they're catching up with their um, the vasodilator, beta blockade, all those things. Then you can proceed with the surgery. Okay? okay. Uh, what else? I, there's something else I needed to mention. Uh, okay. So Post that's all. Huh? 
Yeah, most, most opportunities. Opportunities. yeah, most opportunities you need to look for two things. They tend to have rebound hypertension, so they should be under monitored condition. And then also you want to check for blood glucose. They tend to have hyperinsulinemia and they tend to go hypoglycemic. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, the other thing is I need to mention about 30 to 40 percent of patients with few chromosoma have some some genetic predisposition to it. So a lot of them should be, or most of them should be referred for geneticists. Okay. All right. Um, uh, this basically. Uh, conclude that part. I know there's a few questions. We need to go through the questions again. Uh, right, uh, Ali? Uh, yes, doctor. Uh, okay. Thank you, Dr. Farraj um, Al-Hajri uh, for joining. And next we will uh, put the MCQ questions again and this time we will discuss them. So we'll start with the first question. All right, so you are performing a focus parathyroidectomy for a 55 years old female with a primary hyperparathyroidism. The preoperative localization study showed the right inferior parathyroid adenoma. Intraoperatively, you were unable to identify the parathyroid adenoma. What is the most common location for missed parathyroid adenoma at re-exploration? You can, the results are up on the screen. Okay, correct, nice, 61. Uh, 40% get the question, or almost 50% uh, get the question correct. So it's actually normal anatomical position. We'll move to the next question. You are performing uh, a focused parathyroidectomy with intraoperative parathyroid hormone monitoring on a 56 years old female with a primary hyperparathyroidism. Pre-op localization study indicated left superior parathyroid adenoma. Intraoperatively, the pre-incision and pre-excision were 15 and 17 respectively. Following the excision of the abnormal gland, the five and the 10 minute levels were 12 and 13 respectively. What is the most appropriate next step? All right, so that's, that's good. So perform a bilateral neck exploration, correct? That's good. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. Okay, uh, a 40 years old female with a nephrolithiasis and osteopenia underwent parathyroidectomy for primary hyperparathyroidism. During the surgery, you identified all parathyroid glands that appeared normal, but the left inferior gland. All attempts to identify, to identify it were un unsuccessful, not successful, correction, unsuccessful. So you were not able to identify it, okay? Uh, and you decided to conclude the surgery. Postoperatively, the patient remained... Uh, uh, hyperparathyroid. Uh, what is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? All right, almost 60% has the correct, C is the correct answer. So I just need to point out one thing here, okay? Failure to identify a parathyroid gland is not shame. It happens to all of us. You do enough surgery, it's gonna happen to you. This is not a shame. You shouldn't be ashamed, it's gonna happen. Just when, when this has happened to you, just make sure your localization study and you should not take the patient to the operating room unless it's localized, okay? It's gonna happen to you at some point. I, all the people I've trained with had multiple of those cases, okay? All right, now we're gonna move on to the adrenal questions. Okay, let me see. Uh, no, those uh, questions. All right, okay. So during a negative, negative trauma workup, for a 50 years old male, you discover three centimeter right adrenal mass. What is the most appropriate next step? Oh yeah, okay, good. So basically you've identified this dental adrenal mass. Your first thing to do is basically, I mean, after history and physical examination is the biochemical workup. Good. Okay. So to the, next, to the last uh, question. Last question. You are evaluating a 60 years old male with a hyperaldosteronism found during workup for refractory hypertension. Localization study with a CT scan showed uh, right adrenal mass measuring 3.5 centimeter. What is the most appropriate uh, next step in the management of this patient? All right, so 50% said adrenalectomy. All right, okay. So this is actually a very tricky question, okay? Hyperaldosteronism or hyperaldosteronoma, the tumor is actually less than 1.5 centimeter, okay? So the one, the answer is actually selective venous sampling, okay? All right? Yes. Um, two 
things about the question here you need to pay attention to the age of the patient okay age of the patient if the patient was less than 40 years old and had an adrenal mass then you would you know the incidentaloma are very rare or you know not as frequent but somebody who's 60 years old maybe five to six percent of them will have some sort of an, a, a incidentaloma because we know above 70 10 percent will have some sort of incidentaloma in the ct imaging okay so 3.5 is too big for hyperaldosteronism, okay? Uh, and the age of the patient as well does not fit together. So in this, I would do selective venous sampling, okay? I would do selective venous sampling. That's the correct answer, okay? I apologize, it's hard, but actually this is what you need to pay attention. Whenever you have hyperaldosteronism, or um, you always have to do a selective venous sampling, pretty much, okay? They are very small, very hard to see. I know now with the advancement in CT scan, we can get thinner cuts, even with, it's very hard to identify, okay? Yes. All right, and I think that's conclude the questions, okay? Uh, we have uh, questions coming in from the audience in the Q&A panel, if you okay. would like to answer. I know we are running out of time. Uh, you can have a look. Uh, we have about 20 questions. Okay. So I, I basically I would uh, read it. Uh, yeah, you can read it out loud. So uh, Prachi said, how is increased pituitary gland? Uh, Sorry, I, I... He can put how... the question again, uh, rephrase it and we'll have a look at it again. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, concurrent thyroid disorder, how can it relate to the uh, parathyroid and what, which one, hypo or hyperparathyroidism? So when I say, I, 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 excuse me, maybe I wasn't very clear. So whenever you do a neck surgery, you, wanna, you want the neck surgery to be the first and the last surgery in the neck because reoperation are very difficult and associated with a lot of um, morbidities to the patient, okay? So what you're trying to do is uh, concurrent thyroid disease. We know thyroid disease is very prevalent uh, in the population. The majority of them, you don't need anything, but you wanna know if this patient have something in the thyroid that will need surgery, so that you would do the parathyroid surgery and the thyroid surgery at the same time, okay? So that's what I'm trying to get at. If you wanna do a parathyroid surgery, make sure the patient does not have a thyroid surgery to start with, okay? And if there is, you can fix them at the same time, okay? And that will significantly reduce the morbidity of the surgery for subsequent surgery if needed, okay? Uh, Anonymous said, what's a pool sensitivity? So pool sensitivity, and um, those are from meta-analysis. So all the study that was done for ultrasound sensitivity for identifying parathyroid gland, they were put into a meta-analysis and then from the, all those meta-analyses, that's basically the median sensitivity. That's what's mean uh, pool sensitivity. Uh, what is the IOC for primary detection? I think IOC. he's referring to the level of huh? the intra-op. The intra-op level, I think he's referring to. Uh, IO. Uh, if your question is intraoperative PTH, um, basically you want to do intraoperatively, you want to send sample of, uh, PT, of uh, serum for PTH level and you want to see a significant drop once you remove the culprit gland. Okay, uh, uh, Natra, um, he said, ultrasound has only 67 sensitivity. Is it better to send patient directly for, uh, for uh, to 4D CT scan, which is 89% uh, sensitive and hence more accuracy? You're correct. However, when it comes to the neck, ultrasound is the most sensitive um, uh, basically imaging modality to evaluate the neck. It's actually better than anything because you can basically look at it right away and it's basically, you don't have to build an image. And the reason we do an ultrasound, we wanna localize the parathyroid, but also we wanna rule out concurrent thyroid disease uh, in those um, uh, uh, patients. 
So a lot of center in the US have moved away from using ultrasound system EB to using ultrasound 4D CT scan, giving the higher sensitivity and the specificity of 4D CT scan. Okay, the only downside for the 4D CT scan, it's actually has more uh, radiation and then you end up giving the patient iodine or, or contrast. All right, uh, why do you five minutes PTH if you will depend on the 10 minutes? Okay, so this is, you know, this is, um, you wanna see a trend, okay? So this will help you with trending the thing. You wanna see it's actually going down, okay? Um, which is, you know, some people actually don't do that. Some people just go for 10, just, they, they just don't wanna waste time. Um, that's how the Miami criteria was developed. Uh, a lot of people have actually modified it. I didn't go into the modification. Some people will not leave the operative room unless the PTH is actually normal, okay? All right, uh, now. Okay, where are... Okay, now. Uh, you face in the clinic. What is the most symptom you face in the clinic? Is vitamin D level done for every case? Okay, uh, this is um, Muhammad Taghi saying, what's the most symptom you face? So with primary hypothyroidism, believe it or not, a lot of patients um, from all the cases I've done during my training as a resident, during my fellowship, and when I come to Kuwait, they have some sort of fatigue. They always complain of fatigue, tiredness, and uh, the most common symptom nowadays has shifted from all those complications to neurocognitive uh, 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 symptoms, fatigue. And then when you come, when they come to see you in the clinic afterward, they're energetic, they feel better, um, which is, you know, um, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm sure there's a few study out there. I, mean, I haven't been, uh, been busy lately to read up on those things, but that's what I've seen, you know, we actually could do something about that if we do enough cases in Kuwait. All right, why does calcium level differ in pre-incision, not calcium, uh, and pre-excision? Not the calcium level, it's actually the PTH. The reason it differs, because we said PTH, PTH hormone has a very short half-life, uh, 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 half-life is five minutes. By the time, oh, pre-incision and pre-excision, sorry. A pre-incision and pre-excision, because once you mobilize the parathyroid gland, you will release more hormones, so that your parathyroid hormone will be higher. That's uh, not the calcium, the PTH you meant. I get the question. Uh, Samak Suleiman, is four centimeter is the cutoff uh, measure for surgery for benign, non-functional tumor or six? So in the past, people used to do six. Now people actually moved away. They're more aggressive to remove them. Uh, it's actually four centimeter. Anything more than four uh, uh, centimeter would do at least. Um, the way, that's the way I train and what's the recommendation has been uh, done. All right, uh, Halima al Isa, how to approach a thymus during a bilateral neck dissection? Uh, basically what you do is um, you go into the thyrothymic track, you basically pull them up and then you will be able to pull significant amount of the thymus up out the, the, uh, the neck. Uh, it's transcervical, so you don't do sternotomy. That's the bottom line. Okay, uh, and Keith, during the total thyroidectomy, what to do if you accidentally excise the parathyroid gland? Okay, so that's a different topic, but um, what you do is, if you have a, if you excise or uh, devascularize a parathyroid gland, you should always re-implant it, okay? And um, there's multiple ways to re-implant it, but uh, uh, try to implant it in the same side, and the sternocleidomastoid and make sure there's a mark just in case something happened, you need to go back. And then always confirm it's actually the parathyroid, send a frozen section and make sure it's a parathyroid before you transplant it. Not, I mean, if you're not sure, sorry, correct. Okay, Muzib Rahman. Okay, um, is there a possibility of doing thyroid surgery through the axilla serum? Um, so this is my field of interest, minimal invasive thyroid parathyroid surgery. And I've so far I've done about 35 uh, cases. Uh, I've done five in Kuwait and I actually done a one transoral parathyroidectomy, not through the axilla, but actually through the mouth with no scars. I could have put pictures, but uh, that wasn't the scope of the lecture. Okay. Uh, and then we go to Badr Shaiban. What's your opinion in... Uh, 
uh, near infrared imaging to localize parathyroid intraoperatively using the same camera image technique used in the ICG uh, iodocyanine uh, green. It's actually, um, um, when I was in a fellowship in the University of Chicago, we actually had this. Um, uh, and then we were part of the pilot study to actually do it. Uh, I mean, it does it doesn't work. It has some use. Um, the, some of the parathyroid actually light up. Uh, maybe it's going to be in the future, it's going to be like, you know, um, the standard of identifying missing gland. Um, there's a lot of research actually in the U.S. currently actually looking into uh, this. We were one, to, one of the centers to actually uh, do it. Uh, it's time consuming what we found and they have to turn off the room. You have to have a special camera. And um, we had a busy operating room. So my, um, uh, my uh, uh, program director wasn't very keen on using it for every case. Okay, is preoperative alpha and beta blockade mandatory in the field? Um, so all the literature have basically said, you need to use it, should use it. Uh, I know in Germany, there's one center, they actually do not use uh, preoperative alpha blockade. They take the patient but they do about seven cases a day and they have specific anesthesia for those cases. And then actually they don't do any blockade. They just get the patient into the operating room. They put the central line and then they put all what they needed uh, interoperatively. Okay. And then uh, Samira Arif for volume repletion uh, and volume. Beta blockade can do their job. Why do we need salt and water? Okay. For volume repletion. So we need, to give fluid, we need to fill the venous system. So to fill the venous system, what we do is we give them high salt fluid, like, you know, the Gatorade, Powerade, or give them to eat high salt diet and drink a lot of water. Um, uh, some people, uh, including us here in Kuwait, we, we, do, we give like two liters of normal saline uh, prior to the surgery. Okay, uh, anonymous, um, could a patient uh, has a spontaneous uh, remission of primary hyperaldosteronism? If yes, could it relapse again? Um, I'm not sure if actually that exists, um, uh, spontaneous. I know there's a medical treatment for, um, I know there's a medical treatment uh, for a patient with hyperaldosteronism. Uh, you can give them, you know, beta blockade, uh, not beta, you can give them, uh, uh, Aldosterone uh, uh, antagonist, there is two medication. There's, um, I'm blanking now. Uh, aldosterone antagonist, uh, one of them actually very expensive, but um, there is a medical treatment, especially for patients with uh, hyperplasia of the adrenal gland because you can't do bilateral adrenalectomy. It's very morbid surgery. Okay, and I think that's all the questions. Thank you for cover, trying to cover all the questions. I know we had a lot of them. Uh, okay. So I think this concludes uh, the session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Salman. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. And thank you, Dr. Salman, for this wonderful uh, lecture. Um, we, uh, I hope the audience had uh, benefited as much. We can see that in the MCQs, uh, that there was an improvement towards the end. And we enjoyed the case scenarios you provided for our uh, chief residents. Uh, thanks uh, for the chief residents who participated. Thank you again, everybody, for attending. And uh, don't forget, uh, we, can, we can also register for our next session. Uh, you can uh, use these QR codes. Uh, just pull up your phone, uh, scan them, and take you to the next session or to any of our platforms to catch up with our previous uh, sessions, or you can use the link in the chat box uh, for quicker access. Thank you, Dr. Salman. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you guys very much. I really actually enjoyed uh, this uh, session. Uh, I had the chance to actually review what I was studied before because they have been in not used for the past four months. So it was good uh, for me as well. Um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, looking forward to get involved in more lectures actually. You're welcome anytime. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.